and welcome to today's webinar focusing on the value of Citrix DAS on Azure. Now, virtual desktops have been around for some time now, but the switch to remote working as a result of the pandemic has seen a significant increase in demand as organizations explore how best to securely deliver applications and data to remote users. Now, these environments have historically been deployed on premise, but with the maturing of public cloud platforms like Azure, organizations can now take advantage of the capability and elasticity of public clouds to build out their virtual desktop services and there's considerable value in doing so as you're going to learn today. My name is Safi Obadilla, Global Head of Value Advisory at Citrix and I'm joined today by Michelle Polino and Sean Owens from Forrester as well. And so today to kick things off we'll have Michelle providing us with some insight into the market landscape for virtual desktops. I'll then share some information about the specific value that Citrix brings when deploying virtual desktops on Azure. Sean will then then dive into the details of the total economic impact study commissioned by Citrix. And then after that, we'll hear from Jethro and how QBE Insurance has benefited from deploying Citrix virtual apps and desktops on Azure. And so with that, I'll hand over to Michelle to introduce herself and kick things off. Thank you so much, Safi. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Michelle Polino, and I'm a principal analyst at Forrester. I focus my research on a variety of different technologies that allow organizations to transform the way they engage with their employees, with their partners, with their customers, and the technologies that allow them to do that. And today I'm going to talk about the, some of these technologies, virtual desktop infrastructure desktop as a service solutions that are allowing firms across many different sectors, vertical markets, and sizes of organizations to address opportunities to leverage different types of elements of their computing strategy to help the productivity of employees, to allow them to access different types of apps and services, no matter where they need to do that, and to help them to be more productive. So in today's discussion, I'll be providing a bit of context based on survey data from Forrester surveys of global enterprises across many different geographic regions. Um, but first and foremost, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of these technologies that many firms are using. Um, and here you see a, a survey question about various alternatives to client PC technologies that are options for organizations. And I wanna bring your attention to the, the options that are a couple from the far right. Um, one of them is around desktop or cloud hosted virtual desktops, which are being implemented at some level by about 63% of enterprises across the globe in 2020, up from 48% in 2019. Now these desktop as a service solutions help to deploy capabilities in different environments or different applications for customers on demand and are delivered remotely through hyperscale cloud solutions or managed service providers. We're also seeing opportunities for um, application virtualization solutions or virtual applications that are self-contained instances that are separate from their underlying op operating systems. And these application virtualization solutions are also used to deliver one or many applications or a set of them without requiring a full desktop delivery system. So this gives you an idea that momentum for these solutions is significantly rising. The other thing that's important to recognize is adoption of VDI solutions and desktop as a service solutions does vary based on country. And here you see the question about adoption and implementation of these solutions of VDI and DAS by country that we survey at Forrester. And here you see that digitization in the economies of India and China and Australia and other Asia PAC countries is really driving demand for VDI and DAS capabilities. And small and medium enterprises as well as large organizations are really creating growth in these economic opportunities. Now VDI is certainly a variation on client server computing models and it's driving momentum for this um, in many countries propelled by demand for different types of um, opportunities and additional opportunities based on secure internet servers that are available in these regions. 
We also know that these VDI solutions allow enterprises to save money by stretching the life of their computing resources, uh, increasing efficiency and in provisioning their infrastructure and allowing new delivery mechanisms for apps and services that their employees need. So I've been talking a little about, about desktop as a service and VDI solutions, but now let me just talk more specifically about the um, capabilities that VDI offers to folks. And certainly VDI is a little bit of a more mature technology uh, solution. Um, and ultimately this solution really allows for um, capabilities that are provided based on delivering um, server hosted uh, mature capabilities, delivery using as a service um, hosted capabilities and environments that are on remote servers. And each desktop um, instance runs within a virtual machine, often on hypervisors. Now, implementing these solutions does require shared hardware and different types of resources like CPU and memory and storage, as well as different types of network resources. And they can require upfront CapEx investments and lifecycle management costs as compared to the DAS solutions or cloud hosted virtual desktops environments. Now, some of the capabilities here that are driving momentum are really evolving as well. So what, what about some of the profile of these VDI users? So those use cases and the, and the types of users that we have here really vary. Um, some of them are folks that are focused on um, solutions that enterprises are using um, with respect to um, VDI solutions that can help in folks with multiple monitors, different kinds of devices and keyboards that they need, different types of video conferencing capabilities. We also see opportunities to use these solutions for folks that work in specific industries and verticals that have regulated environments, um, such as financial services or in healthcare. And these capabilities also provide um, capabilities to allow organizations to allow workers to work in static environments sometimes involved in things like testing and development environments for folks in product design and development as well. But there are some challenges that organizations need to address as they go down this path. And here you see results from another question that we ask in our surveys with respect to some of those challenges that organizations must, must address. And one of the key challenges that are a part of this is related to performance concerns. Uh, these performance concerns can, up, can come up as you have legacy VDI solutions that have to deal with different elements of technology, um, aspects of networking infrastructure. Is there a storage problem? Is there a glitch in um, you know, some of the servers or something to that effect? So you need to think about performance concerns and the impact that that might have on your employees. Other, uh, other firms are concerned about cost, and that's probably not a, concern, a, a, a surprise because many organizations think about costs when they're implementing new technologies. But some of the, the, the things to think about here are the costs related not just to the infrastructure, but also in managing these uh, capabilities, the data center infrastructure, the software stacks, the server cost, that sort of thing. And other aspects as well come into play when you think about the different types of projects that organizations have to consider. So they have to really balance what is their prioritization for projects? Are there other projects that are higher priority that they need to think about? And other concerns also can, can be considered around the internal resources to support these initiatives. Do you have the right folks that are able to dedicate the resources around managing the data centers, the infrastructure, uh, updating the images, those types of capabilities? So all of these things need to be considered as you deploy these solutions. So one of the things you need to also think about is how then do these solutions such as VDI and DAS solutions really address some of these challenges? And what you can see on this slide is that these solutions can really address some of those challenges. So VDI optimization um, can help address issues around performance and solutions that are tied to that can also achieve cost efficiencies as well. When you think about using 
desktop as a service solutions, those are ideal for addressing issues that are related to technologies that maybe are not as mature and concerns around that, or if you don't have the necessary internal resources to manage these environments. So these solutions really do help to address some of the concerns that are uh, identified by organizations who are deploying these different types of technologies. Michelle, I just had a question there for you, um, and these in insights are great. But I wanted to ask, you know, some organizations may see that desktop as a service or DAS is, is a solution that's better fit for smaller organizations. I mean, can you talk about how you've seen organizations adopt v VDI versus DAS or in some cases both and how these two categories of solutions relate to company size and scale? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, there's there's probably a perception out there that DAS solutions are more appropriate to uh, the smaller enterprises, and and indeed there is a size component, a number of employees, you know, a, a, a size element to considering which solutions are going to work for my organization. But more importantly, I think um, Safi is to think about profiling the the users, the workers, the end users that are going to be um, using these apps, these services in various different locations, in different geographic regions? Are they going to be working at the headquarters all the time or are they going to be out in some of the more distributed locations of your firm? You know, what, what kinds of apps and services do they need access to? And ultimately, some of the characteristics of those workers would be, you know, thinking about the, their location, the types of apps they need, the kinds of quality of experience that they need for those apps and capabilities. So really segmenting the workforce is actually more important and then deciding which of these types of solutions will be most appropriate is the way to go. So I've been talking about uh, virtual desktop solutions and some of the value propositions and challenges organizations are using to address these opportunities. Um, I thought I would just highlight the fact that cloud desktop solutions are helping to extend many of these virtualized environments and opportunities. And how is that happening? Well, these cloud capabilities, these cloud desktop solutions offer standardized capabilities that help organizations deploy complete desktop environments or applications for the end users. And these are delivered in many cases remotely um, through hyperscale cloud providers in many cases. They're accessible through self-service interfaces, which addresses some of the concerns many organizations have with do they have the personnel and resources to deal with these things. And it also employs different types of per-use uh, billing for the apps and the environments that are being used and the workspaces. And so there's a, an efficiency here that can also be achieved from organizations that use these types of capabilities. So what are some of the characteristics here, or maybe how do you profile some of the opportunities for using these cloud desktop solutions? Well, here you see a way to, that we think about it. You know, one way to think about it is profiling the types of uh, workers or end users users of these um, folks that are you are bring your own device users you know if somebody's a company is not able to manage somebody's device then using these types of um, as a service solutions makes more sense for them or if you have a lot of contractors or seasonal employees that are only working in your environment for a window of time and they only need temporary access to desktop environments and applications that's another kind of sec segment of the, the workforce branch office employees can also be relevant here in particular segments and geographically dispersed folks that work in remote locations but have strong connectivity would also be a good profile segment you also need to think about the applications that they're using and some of those applications could include um, highly intense gpu kinds of applications different types of applications around high performance use cases for cad and cam um, applications if you're in engineering and, and product design and development or applications that are tied to business continuity or disaster recovery. And certainly as many of us have lived through the um, pandemic over the past year and a half, um, you know, many folks have not made it into an office and have had to deploy um, these environments in different remote locations. And there also could be use cases requiring different types of local compute requirements, uh, requirements for video, requirements for drones, requirements for different types of field service apps and services as well.
So that just gives you an idea of some of the types of profiles of use cases, as well as the um, segments of workers who might be relevant in using these solutions. The other thing you need to think about is um, you know, some of the, um, the, the kind of ability to address some of the barriers that are, are uh, challenges to this. You know, some of the firms who are moving down this path, you know, they have to think about, well, is there a um, standardization of these offerings? If you need something that's very standardized, you may, you know, that, that's something to consider. Or you may have limited ability to personalize the experiences for employees. Um, you also need to think about timelines. What, what timeline do I have? Do I need to do some investment based on cost or resources and personnel? Or finally, you know, what about the skill sets of my internal employees? Do we have folks that can manage and do the updates and deal with the infrastructure requirements and, and the um, requests they may have along the way from employees? So thinking about those types of characteristics of your existing work environment and your IT organization is also very important here as you're assessing opportunities to use these solutions and where to use them in your organization. So I hope I've given you some idea of not just opportunities around VDI solutions and desktop as a service solutions, but also some of the opportunities that are driving momentum for these solutions as well. Now I'll turn it back over to Safi. Thanks, Michelle, for those insights. So now let's get into the value add that Citrix brings to virtual desktop deployments on Azure, and these are best represented across three key pillars. The first is hybrid multi-cloud and how Citrix enables organizations to manage and deploy virtual desktop workloads, both on-premise as well as public cloud locations like Azure. The next is how Citrix is able to help optimize the management and deployment and operations of your virtual desktop environments with capabilities that can actually help reduce your overall cloud spending. And finally, Citrix can help strike the balance between security and experience, ensuring that your applications and data are protected while not compromising end user experience. It's important to remember that Citrix brings over 30 years worth of experience in delivering virtualized applications and desktops. And with this knowledge and experience, we're able to bring capabilities and performance that are hard for others to match. Now, let me go into a bit more detail into each one of these. The reality is that most organizations are not going to have just one resource location for their infrastructure and applications. They're likely going to embrace a hybrid model where they leverage resources deployed both on-premise and in public clouds. Citrix provides the broader support for deploying resources across both on-premise locations using hypervisors like vSphere, Hyper-V, Citrix Hypervisor and Nutanix, as well as cloud locations like others uh, like Azure and others as well, all through a, a unified management experience. And this means that you can continue to leverage your on-premise infrastructure investments while taking advantage of the scalability and elastic, elasticity that clouds like Azure can provide. And having a unified management approach means that you can choose the best resource location that suits the use case. So if you have a sh short-term requirement for a project, then you could burst into cloud. You may have spare capacity on-premise, on then you could shift some of those virtual desktops over there as well. Perhaps you need uh, access to a high performance or GPU enabled desktop, then you could provision that in Azure. I guess what I'm saying is that having the ability to embrace a hybrid approach gives you the flexibility to meet not only today's needs, but also use cases that may arise in the future as well. How your organization handles the daily operations and maintenance of your virtual desktop platform has a large impact on the cost and overall success of these environments. Citrix helps accelerate the initial deployment and the ongoing management of virtual desktop environments with purpose-built consoles and tools that are proven at scale in the most demanding scenarios. Our image management and provisioning capabilities like machine creation services makes it simple and easy to maintain virtual desktop images centrally rather than desktop by desktop. In addition, we've just launched the public preview of a new feature called image portability, which actually allows you to use the same image for both on-premise and cloud-based deployments. You've got help desk tools like Director, which provides a comprehensive view of end user experience and performance, allowing you to improve 
first contact resolution and minimize the time to take and to, to diagnose and resolve any issues that may come up. Full, full delegated administration and configuration logging also ensures that proper access exists across your teams with a complete audit trail for compliance reasons. You have performance optimizations and power management cap capabilities that add to the overall scalability of the service, as well as helping reduce cloud costs by increasing user density and dynamically managing virtual desktop availability. Th these integrations that we have for both on-premise and cloud locations like Azure mean that organizations can stand up new environments rapidly and on demand as the need arises. And finally, security is at the top of mind for organizations everywhere, especially now with so many people working remotely. Citrix enables you to strike the balance between experience and security, while also providing advanced controls to assess the context of the user and then dynamically apply the appropriate security controls all with a full audit trail. We bring a unified single sign-on experience to applications and desktops to make it easier for users so they don't have to remember different username and passwords and can just get working. With the importance of collaboration tools like Teams, especially when working remotely, it's critical that your virtual desktop can deliver a great experience when it comes to voice and video. And Citrix has been working with Microsoft for over a decade to optimize the delivery of Teams within a virtual desktop. We, we provide granular access controls so, so you can take a contextual approach to how you users connect, what devices they connect from, and what resources they have access to. And to further reduce security risk and protect intellectual property, we also have introduced a number of advanced security features like session recording, watermarking and user behavior analytics as well. There's one other element that's really important uh, and that's securing the connectivity between users and corporate resources. It's not only employees that are more distributed these days, it's also applications. You know, applications live on premise, they live in public clouds, they live in SaaS providers. And this is increasing the overall users exposure to security threats. This means that organizations need to secure the connectivity between users and their applications and protect against malware attacks and zero day vulnerabilities. And backhauling all the SaaS and internet traffic through the data center for security inspection only ends up severely impacting performance and ultimately employee productivity. So Citrix SASE solutions bring together SD-WAN, zero trust access and comprehensive cloud delivered security into a single centralized model. These unified solutions allow organizations to provide secure remote access to applications and the internet, and they're built to meet the complex needs of distributed workforces. All of these security capabilities are why over 400,000 customers worldwide rely on Citrix every day to protect the, their users, their applications and data, all while delivering the best possible user experience. And so having giving you some insights into the value that Citrix brings to virtual desktop deployments on Azure, I want to now turn it over to Sean to help quantify this, this value through the total economic impact model. Sean? Thanks, Safi. <clears throat> I'm Sean Owens, Principal Consultant with Forrester's Total Economic Impact Consulting Team. Um, and I led the TEI to develop the Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Service on Microsoft Azure TEI study commissioned by Citrix. Today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, this TEI study. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, the TEI methodology. Uh, we'll talk about our customers that we interviewed and surveyed and what kinds of pains and opportunities they were looking for um, uh, before they implemented uh, Citrix Cloud. Um, talk about the TEI study results and wrap things up. First, uh, TEI is Forrester's proven business case methodology to quantify the value of a technology investment. And just just a, a question on that. I know Forrester ha have been doing these, these TEI studies for quite some time, and obviously we've, we've collaborated from a Citrix perspective, but what makes the total economic methodology so unique? Thanks, Afi. I appreciate the question. 
Um, we like to think TEI uh, does more than other business case methodologies, uh, such as TCO or ROI. Uh, we do include benefits and costs, uh, as most, uh, if not all, do. Um, but we risk adjust every metric to provide a more credible and conservative approach. And we also consider longer term options beyond the initial investment and analysis period, what we call flexibility. TEI was started at Forrester more than 20 years ago uh, with uh, more than uh, 10 of the past years delivering TEIs to Citrix. Uh, TEI includes five steps uh, based uh, mainly on um, uh, uh, interview and survey responses with real customers at organizations such as uh, our audience today. Uh, we build a, a financial model and composite organization based on that primary data. Uh, and then we've developed the case study uh, as well as some additional assets such as this webinar, uh, which are or will be published on Citrix, uh, uh, Citrix's website. So first I wanna to skip to the end. <clears throat> and give you a little bit of a sneak peek at the results for our TEI study uh, based on, I mentioned a composite organization. Our composite organization is a, uh, a company with 15,000 employees, 5,000 um, uh, virtual apps and desktops users. Um, their investment in Citrix virtual apps and desktops with Microsoft Azure uh, delivered an ROI of 153%, uh, present value of benefits of 6.7 million, and a net present value, which is benefits minus costs, uh, of more than four million. And that's over our uh, three-year analysis period. So that's great. You've seen some of the results. You see that they're positive results. Nice, but that's not very helpful for you, I, I realize. So uh, for the rest of our time, we're gonna uh, get into more details to provide more examples and context that you can take uh, uh, to both understand the benefits and costs in the TEI study and also apply them to your own organization. So first, we're going to uh, uh, look at the journey of the customers that we interviewed and surveyed. Um, and one of our uh, organizations uh, wanted to provide an example of our, an Australian insurance company uh, and a, a key pain that they had uh, trying to manage their on-premises. They did actually have virtualization uh, implemented for many of their users, but still had to manage three global implementations uh, of that and trying to synchronize all that uh, was was very difficult, very painful, and brought them to uh, investigating this this uh, uh, this solution. And so we have some key uh, uh, pains that we heard from uh, the organizations that we spoke to as well as some goals that they wanted to achieve with a new technology investment in virtual apps and desktops. Uh, they were uh, seeing uh, on-premises management uh, uh, inefficiencies, inflexibility in that on-premises uh, uh, implementation, uh, higher security exposure, or at least high enough security exposure that they needed to do something about it uh, and mitigate uh, and avoid any issues in the future. And uh, given those pains and wanting to find a resolution, they wanted to find uh, a tool, uh, a, a solution that could provide employees secure access to be able to do their jobs, including lots of remote access, uh, of course. Uh, they wanted to improve their IT management efficiency, and they wanted to support a cloud-first uh, strategy. Uh, I think a lot of these uh, are uh, uh, these and more uh, of, uh, of the lists and, and details that Michelle shared uh, uh, help kind of identify the context and the situation that brought them to this um, uh, uh, to needing a solution and uh, they decided they did their investigation and decided to either improve or start a new virtual apps and desktops uh, implementation with Citrix virtual apps and desktops uh, implemented on Microsoft Azure taking advantage of many of the features and technologies that uh, Safi uh, 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 summarized. So let me just give you a little detail of the customers we spoke to. We interviewed four organizations between 1,000 and 12,000 employees in size, um, all using virtual apps and desktops on Microsoft Azure. Um, some included the Azure Virtual Desktop Entitlement. Uh, two had migrated from a smaller Citrix on-premises uh, virtualization 
uh, two were new to virtualization. Um, and one, as I mentioned, is based in Australia, and I'll try to highlight their situation a bit more than others to provide the local context. We also surveyed 31, uh, or received surveys from 31 IT decision makers uh, worldwide, uh, mostly US, but some worldwide coverage there as well. And these um, I, uh, IT decision makers are responsible for virtualization at organizations as small as 200 employees, uh, but many were uh, 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 20,000 or larger. Um, they were all Citrix and Azure customers. They, 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 were, they are all Citrix and Azure customers and all have uh, re reported that they've in, uh, enabled the Azure Virtual Desktop entitlement. So here are the key benefits uh, the, as reported by our interviewees and survey respondents. Uh, just to cover the categories first, we saw uh, IT efficiencies, end user productivity, and reduce costs, including legacy hardware and software uh, cost savings. I'll get into some of the numbers in a moment, but first I wanted to explain a, more about the composite organization. Gave you a little bit of detail, but I wanted to provide a bit, little bit more context. So again, you can take the examples that I'll be sharing in much more detail and think about them for your own organization. Our composite organization is a company of 15,000 total employees. 5,000 virtual apps and desktop users today. Um, and we've got some other business assumptions here as well. Uh, before uh, Citrix and Azure, uh, they had uh, they reported 1.5, uh, one and a half PC related help desk calls, uh, onboarding rate and some legacy software costs. And so Sean, I just had one question there. You know, obviously this composite organization is quite large at 15,000 employees. Uh, I wanted to get your perspective, you know, how would these benefits translate to organizations that are perhaps smaller or in some cases much larger than that? Yeah, uh, thanks Safi, that's a great question. And it's a, a question we hear a lot in our in our TEI presentations. Um, the TEI is, a, is officially a case study. Uh, and it is meant to be an example to help you build your own custom business case. Uh, some of the uh, numbers I'm showing on the screen here, and uh, if you can, uh, uh, I know Safi will share some links at the end, you can go and download the full study. And um, there are going to be some additional benefits that I won't have a lot of time to talk about today, as well as additional details and assumptions for each of those. Uh, for example, the salary metrics, I'm not putting those on the screen today, those are very dependent on where you are. You should cross that out, write in your own salary. You should cross out the number of employees and write the number of employees you have, how many virtual um, uh, uh, users you could potentially have based on some of Michelle's use cases uh, or, or thinking about some of Michelle's use cases. And some of these other um, uh, metrics, um, uh, number of IT employees and so on, those are all things that are uh, uh, inputs and assumptions that we've made for our composite organization based on the organization uh, the companies that we've interviewed and surveyed those i'm sure are not exactly your metrics so you should uh, replace those with yours and in the also in the tei study there's tables uh, for each benefit and cost those tables have those uh, assumptions and inputs listed as well as the 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 met uh, the, the math to come up with the subtotals and grand totals uh, for the financial results and also provided are the equations. So if you cross out and put in your own uh, numbers, you the, the, the equations are right there for you to follow to be able to recalculate your own subtotals and financial totals for your own business case. And hopefully going through that process with one or two of these benefits that are in the TEI study, uh, as you look around your own organization, you might find other opportunities we didn't hear or didn't have a chance to investigate in our TEI study. Uh, might be too new, might they just uh, organizations may not have thought about that as a benefit yet, uh, but something that doesn't mean you can't measure it yourself and you can follow the methodology to uh, uh, build your own benefits and include that in your business case. Hope that answered your, your, your question. That was a bit of a long answer. <laughs> so now let's get into some of the study results. Again, here's that list of benefits uh, with the financial totals now. Uh, these are three-year risk-adjusted present value totals uh, for our composite organization, and you can see the relative scale and size of each of these benefits. But again, like showing the ROI and net present value numbers, these aren't still very helpful to you. Great, IT management efficiency is a, is a big benefit, um, but 
you know, what is that, you know, how do I get to there? How do, how do, you know, how do I measure that for my organization? How do I see if there's even an opportunity there? Well, let's get into that detail. Uh, so we're going to look at some of these benefits in more detail, try to walk you through it, show you where you might replace some of the inputs and assumptions in the TEI study with your own situation to build your own business case. Overall, um, our, uh, for our composite organization, uh, we identified an IT management efficiency improvement of 10% uh, across the uh, team of 100 full-time employees focused on PC management for our composite organization. Uh, that 10% improvement uh, enabled by cloud-first efficiencies enabled by CVAD on Azure. Um, and additionally, there was a uh, identified a 33% help desk call reduction for PC related issues. Um, for our organization, um, adding up the number of IT employees, the efficiency improvement uh, using a standard US uh, based IT admin salary, we've added that up to a, a, a three year risk adjusted present value benefit of 1.9 million. And again, as I just talked to in detail, you can think about this for your own organization obviously which salary you might use you might you know you certainly would replace that with your your local um, metrics um, but you can also look at how large your organization is how many IT admins you have how much time they spend on imaging and support and escalations and also look at your uh, uh, we'll, we'll call it the you know the maturity of your organization uh, for our composite organization, we had some, uh, some as I showed, uh, that were already, uh, had already adopted some virtualization, some were new to it. Uh, uh, we've kind of included both in our composite organization. Uh, you might be brand new to virtualization, uh, meaning you might have a little additional opportunity. So perhaps this is an, a 10% improvement that you might, uh, you might estimate, but it might be a little higher, 12, 15%. Um, you might have a very large on-premises uh, virtual app, uh, app and desktop virtualization implementation. Uh, perhaps the opportunity is a little less for you, um, uh, but you know, still, you know, opportunities to be had from um, uh, 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 cloud uh, implementation. Uh, so you might consider maybe an eight or five percent improvement here. So uh, not only can you look at the, assum uh, the assumptions and inputs that you might apply for your own organization, but you can also consider what kind of opportunity you have. And you can use the defaults in the TEI study, 10% for here, or you can adjust that uh, based on your own assumptions and estimates and opportunities. So then uh, uh, the next benefit I wanted to cover is IT employee onboarding. Um, uh, overall, we're uh, saving about one workday per new employee. Um, a, uh, a, a before Citrix and Azure, a new employee took 15 hours of IT time uh, in terms of imaging, account setup, facilities, and uh, other device management tasks. Today, that is uh, down to seven hours uh, by, uh, by being able to take advantage of uh, a virtualization setup, uh, uh, the, the standardized uh, setups that, that, uh, that, that uh, uh, enables as well. Uh, 15 minus seven, that's eight hours saved per uh, employee onboarded. Uh, uh, multiply that by the uh, 1500 onboarding um, uh, tasks per year that we've uh, estimated for our composite organization. That's both new and transferred employees that might need new devices uh, or new setups. Uh, and uh, the 1500 uh, onboardings times eight hours, again, times a standard IT salary based on US uh, salaries adds up to 1.2 million. For your own organization, you'll think about how many onboarding, uh, onboarding tasks you have, uh, what kind of app uh, delivery complexity you might have, uh, your IT provisioning processes, and if there's other inefficiencies there that you can take advantage of. And third, we wanted to uh, walk through the end user productivity. Uh, for our composite organization, before Citrix and Azure. Uh, and again, knowing that some of those employees did have a virtualization solution before, a Citrix virtualization solution before, just an on-premises solution. So they had some, some efficiencies and productivity opportunities for some of those employees, but not everyone was, not everyone, not as many as they have today were using it. Um, as well as not every employee was having such a bad time. Um, you know, they may have been okay, 
they're now a little better now and uh, and certainly uh, uh, you know a, 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 uh, have their efficiencies and opportunities from being able to take advantage of uh, uh, Citrix virtual apps and desktops today. Uh, but uh, frankly, there were some that were just kind of feeling the pain on a regular basis. They were making a lot of support calls. They had old devices that seemed to be failing a lot. Um, they had a, a high need for remote access, and certainly there's more and more of those people these days. Um, their their VPN kept, uh, you know, stopped working, um, and and re you know always required support. Uh, so what we did is we've identified a, a core group. We won't call them power users, but at least a, a core group of employees that saw significant interruptions in the past that were. Uh, uh, mitigated and uh, you know uh, eliminated or significantly reduced with um, Citrix and Azure, uh, and identified uh, a five percent improvement in productivity for those for those employees. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it's two hours per week. Two hours per week uh, times our seven hundred and fifty people times again a U.S. Uh, standard uh, end user salary, uh, you know across many jobs. Uh, just kind of a, 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 a very average salary. Um, that adds up to nearly $2 million uh, in our risk adjusted three year present value totals. Uh, so even though that may not seem like a lot of people and may not seem like a, a large productivity improvement, that does add up to uh, some significant numbers pretty quickly. Uh, and again, for your own organization, you might think of what kinds of opportunities your employees have, how many employees are, are you know, faced with avoidable uh, support calls, or avoidable app request pains, or avoidable remote access delays and blockings uh, that are keeping them from being able to do their job. There are, as I said, a few other benefits that I, I don't have as much time to get to today, but you can read the full study and uh, get more details um, as uh, on these, as well as additional details on even on the benefits that I did walk through. Uh, but some of these benefits include um, uh, legacy cost savings. Uh, for example, the uh, our, our insurance company identified how Autoscale uh, was a key enabler of value and being able to eliminate some additional legacy costs. Uh, the workplace services manager there said that they use Autoscale to control how many machines are available at any given time, and they've been able to fine tune the availability of PCs and not have a lot of unused virtual machines. Uh, additionally, um, improved security. Uh, survey respondents reported that their risk, risk exposure reduced from 44% of revenue at risk to down to 33% today. Employee satisfaction was also reported to be significantly improved. Um, and uh, our survey respondents also identified that uh, Microsoft Virtual uh, uh, Vir uh, Microsoft Azure Virtual Desktop Entitlement was all, uh, a key enabler in their decision uh, to invest in uh, Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops. Uh, and they've taken advantage of that as a, a additional enabler of some license cost savings. So now in uh, running up to our conclusion here, uh, wanted to come back to the benefits again to um, uh, one more time to uh, show the totals again. And now that you've understood and, and walked through uh, how we got to uh, at least some of these benefits, can hopefully understand uh, how these might apply to your own organization and how the relative sizes of these might identify some priorities for your own organization. These benefits add up to a uh, three-year risk-adjusted present value of 6.7 million. Uh, keeping that in mind, we do also want to keep uh, uh, consider costs uh, to calculate ROI, return on investment. We do need to look at our, our cost uh, investment needs. Uh, uh, the investment in um, uh, Citrix and Azure uh, uh, primarily included the uh, subscription costs um, for uh, CVAD as well as some additional uh, necessary uh, Microsoft Azure subscriptions, um, ongoing costs of some, you know, some a, a few uh, new CVAD related IT tasks, and as well as the implementation tasks of setting up new and migrating old on premises virtualization. Um, these costs add up to a present value of 2.65 million uh, risk adjusted present value over our three year period. Uh, 6.7 million in total benefits minus that uh, two point um, uh, and some in costs add up to a uh, 
three-year risk-adjusted net present value of just over four million and an ROI of 153 percent. And again, you can uh, 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 take these examples to prepare your own uh, business case and come up with your own uh, uh, summary results such as these. You can calculate your ROI, net present value, build a cash flow chart based on the um, uh, uh, by applying your own uh, inputs and assumptions for your own organization, thinking about the opportunities for your own organization and what those benefits might add up to for um, for your uh, for your uh, uh, situation, um, and uh, use this. Uh, you can use the full TEI study to be able to uh, get into uh, more details with that. So I want to leave you with a few takeaways. Uh, as I just said, I encourage you to review the full TEI study. Um, consider your own situation uh, compared to the assumptions uh, included for our composite organization. Uh, consider your own desktop management, end user situations, and other uh, maturity uh, 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 states and opportunities for improvement. And then you can add up your own benefits using the TEI study calculations as well as your own data. I do have a couple of slides that I just want to scroll through quickly. Uh, if some of the acronyms um, and uh, terms I was throwing around, there's a few definitions here you can check on, uh, as well as a few disclosures. Mainly, I just wanted to highlight again that this is a, a bridged version, just a few details from the full TEI study, uh, which included the custom survey research, uh, both commissioned by Citrix and again, uh, downloadable on Citrix's website. And with that, I wanna thank you all for your time and I'll turn it back over to you, Safi. Thank you. Great, thanks, Sean. Some great insights on the tangible value that organizations can realize by adopting Citrix virtual apps and desktops on Azure. Now, before we get to the q and I wanted to share where you can get the full TEI study for yourself and see all the metrics and insights into the value that a joint Citrix virtual apps and desktops on Azure solution can bring. And you can download this at more.citrix.com forward slash Citrix TEI. There's also some additional tools available that may be useful as you start to plan and deploy your environment. Aside from the, the TEI study, we've actually developed a Citrix and AVD cost calculator, which can help you estimate your cost savings. And this can be found at more.citrix.com forward slash Citrix AVD savings. For more information on how Citrix and AVD work together and how to get started, you can head to the uh, landing page at more.citrix.com forward slash AVD. And finally, to get more insight into the roadmap for Citrix virtual apps and desktops and see all the new and innovative features that we're working on, you can go to more.citrix.com forward slash Citrix roadmap. Okay, and so with that, now let's transition into the Q&A part of this session. So I'm just gonna look at these questions here and Sean, I think we've got one for you guys, um, can you discuss the value add in moving from on-prem VDI to the cloud? Thanks, Safi. That's a great question and a common question for any on-premises to cloud uh, uh, migration uh, migration story. Uh, so the TEI is based on a composite organization that was uh, not completely new to virtualization um, and had some on-premises virtualization before. And so we did identify some cost savings that are included in our analysis. Um, that includes offloading some IT tasks to the cloud provider, such as server maintenance, and shifting significant premises, uh, significant on-premises hardware and software spending um, from um, capital expenses to operating expenses, uh, including the ability, or CapEx to OpEx, uh, including the ability to pay only for what you use and being able to save some additional uh, money that way not having to build out an infrastructure, pay for a data center and so on. Um, and especially not having to pay for an infrastructure based on your estimated highest period of traffic to be able to meet scale, you now can adjust that scale as needed with your cloud provider. All right, cool. Thanks, Sean. I think we've got mm -hmm. time for one more question here. Um, where can I learn more about deploying Citrix virtual apps and desktops on Azure? And obviously I'll take that one. The best place is actually uh, there's a, 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 a site, a part of our website called TechZone, T E C H Z O N E, techzone.citrix.com. And that's where you can find a whole range of documents, videos, reference architectures, deployment guides. There's just a, a wealth of information there to help you guys get started 
on uh, on your journey in, in deploying Citrix virtual apps and desktops on Azure. Um, and so that's all the time we have for questions. Um, for the questions that didn't get answered, we will we will f a follow up with each of you individually after the session. And so with that, I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you, Sean and Michelle, for helping with this session and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.